the whole issue of NATO enlargement is a hugely controversial issue which goes back a long way. Um, when the Berlin Wall came down, it was not at all clear that there was going to be any NATO expansion at all. There was no particular reason to do that. Um, most people felt that what would happen as a result of the war going down would be that the two military blocs, NATO and Warsaw Pact, would progressively shut up shop and that there would be a kind of trans-European security architecture which would involve all players. However, something had to be done about East Germany. East Germany uh, was uh, a problem in the sense that if Germany is to be unified, and it happened very fast, then the question arises as to whether East Germany becomes a part of NATO, stays a part of the Warsaw Pact, whether East and West Germany should both withdraw from their respective pacts, or whether Germany should be reunited, reunified under uh, NATO, or, or both, both sides of Germany be in NATO. So there were very, very extensive discussions with the Russians and with uh, the, German, the two Germanys over uh, the early months of 1990. And in the initial stages of this, there were a lot of declarations made by the German Foreign Minister, by the German Chancellor, by James Baker, who was Secretary of State at the time, to the effect that uh, there would be no NATO expansion towards East Germany. It's very, very clear. It's all in the archival documents now. It's all in the public record. There was repeated assurances that would, there would be no NATO expansion one inch to the east. There was then an arrangement that there would be a special military status for East Germany. But progressively, that um, agreement it wasn't ever put down in writing, but it was very much an understanding between the West and the Russians that this would be the case. Progressively, that just um, went out of the window, so that once uh, President Bush father and the German Chancellor Kohl had had their meeting in uh, early March and decided that the whole of Germany would remain in NATO, there wasn't a lot that the Russians could do about it. They weren't happy, but they were paid a very large check by the, by the Germans, and eventually Gorbachev allowed for the reunification of Germany under NATO. That was supposed to have been the end of it, but progressively um, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, when they thought about their future, uh, felt that being part of NATO was something that they were entitled to, something that they wanted very much, and they put a lot of pressure on the Clinton administration to open up NATO further to Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. This then becomes extremely controversial, and many leading American diplomat statesmen, George Kennan, the father of containment, wrote a very important uh, op-ed in the New York Times saying this is the most fateful error of American foreign policy in the entire post-Second post World War period. There was a lot of, lot of opposition, but there was also a lot of um, support for bringing these countries into NATO to stabilize them, to give them some sort of future. So the, the, the problem started way back and once the ball was set in motion, then the demand for NATO membership grew and grew and grew, and eventually in 2004 it was agreed that we would have uh, many of the countries of the former Warsaw Pact, including countries of the former Soviet Union, that is the three Baltic countries, as part of NATO. Now, throughout this whole process, the Russians were getting more and more alarmed, more and more angry. Uh, they feel that they uh, were made promises which were then uh, not kept. And this is sort of built up so that when the final push came in 2008 from the George W. Bush administration and people like Senator McCain to bring Georgia and Ukraine into NATO, the Russians said enough is enough. And basically we then get the invasion of Georgia in 2008, just literally weeks after a summit in Bucharest, a NATO summit in Bucharest, at which a decision was kind of fudged as to whether to bring Georgia and Ukraine. In. So I think that um, there's a lot of uh, support for the view that NATO enlargement from the outset was not the smartest idea. Uh, it has helped to produce a very 
polarized and confrontational situation of which the Ukraine crisis is the latest manifestation. So at the most recent summit of NATO in Newport in Wales in September of this year, uh, it was decided that for the moment there can be absolutely no question of bringing Georgia and Ukraine into the alliance. But there is this statement in the Bucharest Declaration from 2008 which says they will become members. That's a quote. They will become members. What does that mean? So I think um, we've created a situation which has exacerbated the polarization between the West and Russia, and that's where we are today. Yeah, NATO has talked about very little else ever since the end of the Cold War. The, 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 the problem for NATO was that most American uh, IR, international relations specialists, particularly of the realist school, assumed that NATO would gradually fade away. Uh, now, it's a huge bureaucracy, 40,000 employees, uh, and uh, it serves very useful purposes for transatlantic dialogue, security and other matters, and so on. So NATO has been in the business of trying to find another purpose, another core business than nuclear deterrence of the Soviet threat. And uh, throughout this whole period, probably the most important thing that NATO has done is through um, an agency called Partnership for Peace, where countries in Central and Eastern and quite far away, uh, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, countries like this, have engaged with NATO to learn the business of civilian control of the military, security sector reform, how to produce a professional disciplined military. And so the generalization of NATO standards across a huge geographical area has been one of the most um, uh, constructive and the most effective things that NATO has done. Having said that, however, the problem arises is that there are within NATO a lot of countries that are in the expression free riding. This question of burden sharing, the sharing of the costs and the uh, responsibilities within NATO goes back to the founding of the alliance in the 1940s, 1950s. It's never been resolved. The United States has always, for one reason or another, under one president or another, accepted to assume the overwhelming burden of the cost of NATO. Currently, the figure is, this is a contested figure, but it seems to be that the United States picks up about 75% of the cost of NATO. The other 27 countries together pick up 25% of the cost. And some countries are doing virtually nothing. Big countries like Germany, uh, NATO, we are, uh, NATO expects its member states to pay 2% of their GDP into the military budget. Only three countries in NATO actually do that. Four countries, I think. Germany is down below 1%. Uh, and these uh, problems which this, uh, which this causes in terms of resentments and uh, lack of coordination, lack of cohesion within the alliance, a sense that it is a two-tier alliance where uh, some are really doing all the heavy lifting and the others are free riding. That problem has been a major problem within NATO right throughout. It remains a very, very important problem. And in an attempt to try to solve that problem, at the end of the 1990s, the European Union, under a lot of um, pressure from the United States decided that it would create a European military project called the Security and Defense Project, European Security and Defense Project, because the assumption was that if countries can free ride on America in NATO, because America accepts to do this and because America is the leader, and so on and so forth, if you put them in a European uh, agency or European project, they will be more likely to stump up the money to transform their militaries into something more useful. And that uh, project has now been running for 15 years. The problem is that it hasn't produced any better results. There are lots and lots of um, 
uh, of projects, of agreements to pool and share military capacity, to specialize in certain areas of military capacity so that there isn't constant duplication and uh, redundancy, but the actual impact of that so far has been extremely limited and is getting worse. Well, this goes back really to the Kosovo intervention in 1999, where NATO, the NATO member states, for a whole variety of reasons, decided that uh, there had to be a military operation to bring the Serbian president, Slobodan Milosevic, to heel. <laughs> and um, we went through an enormous number of diplomatic initiatives. There was a security conference in Rambouillet outside of France, outside of Paris, to try to resolve the issue. But all of that was sort of uh, for the gallery. It was very clear that there was eventually there was going to have to be a military operation. At least the Allies were determined to do that. The United States was not happy with it, uh, but eventually accepted that this was going to have to happen. At that point, uh, the issue arises, we have to go to the United Nations for a Security Council resolution authorizing military action of a humanitarian nation, a nature, this is sort of, you know, in the whole uh, spirit of the humanitarian interventions of the 1990s, we have to go to the Security Council to get authorization. Now, it was absolutely clear that neither Russia nor China would allow this. They would both veto it. Therefore, the operation, when it took place, and there was this bombing campaign that lasted for 78 days over Serbia and Kosovo, um, was done without UN authorization. To that extent, and Kofi Annan, the uh, United Nations uh, Security, the United Nations Secretary General, said at the time that the, the Kosovo operation was illegal. Now, the answer which NATO gave to that was, well, it may be illegal, but it's legitimate. What does that mean? Well. The, uh, the rationale is that NATO is 16 slash 19 member states. In fact, the three East European states, Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic, joined NATO right at the middle of this Kosovo bombing campaign. So they come in in the middle of a war. Um, so anyway, the 19 NATO nations are all democracies. Therefore, this confers legitimacy on their actions. That is the proposition. I personally find that uh, a questionable proposition. I'm not sure that we can say that because countries are democracies, they have the right to intervene in other countries in the name of some sort of superior status. Um, certainly that is a message which the Russians have turned on its head, citing Kosovo as a precedent and as a pretext for their invasion of Georgia, citing Kosovo for their grabbing of these two enclaves in Georgia, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and saying, look, you did Kosovo, we're doing exactly this. They cited Kosovo repeatedly when they grabbed Crimea. And in Vladimir Putin's speech from the Kremlin after the Crimea instance, he uses Kosovo as the justification for what Russia has done in Crimea. So it's a very dangerous uh, precept to say our action was illegal, but nevertheless, it was legitimate. This was actually the conclusion of the International Commission of Inquiry on Kosovo, which produced a 200-page report in 2002 or 2003, uh, in which that sentence exists. The Kosovo operation was clearly illegal under international law, but nevertheless, it was legitimate. I think that we need to revisit this because we are setting very dangerous precedents uh, by uh, using that sort of approach. My view is that uh, these operations must go through the United Nations, should get a United Nations Security Council resolution, as was the case for Somalia, for Kurdistan, for Libya. But the way the interventions have been done, and the issue of mission creep, that is to say that the initial resolution authorizes protection of the population under something called responsibility to protect, or at least that's invoked, but the mission becomes regime change and the, uh, you know, uh, basically taking a major part in a civil war. 
So I think we really have, as a result of this precise issue of legality and legitimacy, to revisit the underlying bases on which the West does humanitarian intervention. But we've got to get it right because we have to have the Russians and the Chinese and others on board. If this is going to be done in a purely confrontational mode, then we'll find that others can play the same game. Wow, that is a huge question. That is a question about which I have already written four or maybe five books. I can't, I've lost count. I mean, I've spent the last 30 years of my life answering that question. So, briefly, <laughs> um, I think that uh, objectively, in a global context, the interests, the vital interests, the strategic interests and the security interests of the 28 member states of the European Union are massively convergent. They are much more convergent than divergent. If you set this little tiny geographical area at the one end of the vast Eurasian continent, you set that little European geographical area into a global context and you ask yourself questions about how Europe is going to interact with the rising powers, Brazil, India, China, uh, I'm not sure Russia is a rising power, but it's a, you know, it's a power, uh, how Europe is going to continue to interact with the United States in a situation where the United States is prioritizing its relation with Asia. Europe has to act as a single actor, has to speak with a single voice. Otherwise, the rising powers, like China, like Russia, will play ring, will run rings around the different member states. They know that. They know perfectly well that the only way they can be an effective actor, even in the region, let alone on the global stage, is if they speak with a single voice. And yet, to date, they're having great difficulty in finding that single voice. This is not really surprising given that the 28 member states of the European Union have very, very, very different historical pasts, have very different security cultures. Some are expansionist and imperialist and you know militarist, others are very, very quiet. To try to coordinate and create a single security culture in Europe is going to take a lot of time. But I think that progressively as um, as the the stakes in a world which is undergoing power transition uh, get higher, the Europeans will have very little alternative than to coordinate their thinking on security, their procurement of security instruments, and their deployment of those instruments. It's going to take much longer than many people thought when this thing was launched in the mid to late 90s. We've got a very long way to go. There has been progress. To my mind, it's been abominably slow and inadequate, but nevertheless that progress is ongoing and we now have a new team in Brussels as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, there is steam building up for the Europeans to think again about how they can coordinate their own military activities. This then poses the problem of the relationship with NATO, about which I've written far too much. Uh, I think that there is only space in Europe for one serious security actor, uh, which is why I'm proposing the merger of these, these, these two. Um, but in terms of coordination and transfer of sovereignty, it's a huge project. We are making progress. We're going to have to be patient.